I know she's extremely emotional right now. She's crying, you know, very reserved. She pulled me out of my house and my daughter, man. I don't know what's going on. Struggled these past 16 years for closure. Closure in many ways. My mom mattered. I still feel connected to my mother, even in her, her death. How can I not? She's my mom. No, what I did, Mr. Hayes, I asked you about Rachel Bay. I asked you, did I know her? You emphatically said no. I asked you if you've ever had any communication or interaction with her. You emphatically said no. I asked you if you ever had any sex with her. You emphatically said no. Then a couple minutes ago, you said, I didn't do anything to anybody. On December 26, 2005, Stacy Dittmer and Laketa Gunther were cooking dinner for Christmas Eve. Laketa, a 45-year-old divorced woman, and a mother of five kids, was going through a rough time. Indeed, she was well-liked in her social circle and worked as a sex worker. Meanwhile, Laketa craved a drink, so she went to a bar not too far from where she was. After a few drinks, she left the bar with a black man but never returned to Stacy. A few hours passed, and she didn't show up. When Stacy got super worried, she rushed to the bars, Laquetta always frequented. But no trace of Laquetta. But little does Stacy know, that police have already located Laquetta's body. On December 26, 2005, the body of Laquetta was found in an alley, off North Beach Street in Daytona Beach. She was shot in the back of her head, execution style, and her shackled body was left between two buildings, in a kneeling position. She had been left naked, except for the socks she was wearing. Her killer was so reckless to clean his mess, so detectives collected a lot of semen from the scene, but still, DNA tests showed that no matches were found. I felt a duty to my mother to be here today in person to testify before this court that my mother meant something to many people, and she was loved. <laughs> I'm about to turn 41 in March. My mother was only 45 when she was taken from us in 2005. It's become very real to me just how young she still was. She had so much more life to live, love to give, and self-growth to achieve. My children... Only 19 days after Laquetta's murder, her friend, 34-year-old Julie Green, was found dead in the very same manner. She had also been shot in the back of the head, but they didn't find any DNA evidence. They only found tires for a 2003 Taurus or Sable, but it didn't take them anywhere. All it did was make everyone wonder if there was a serial killer in town among the locals. But the more pressing question was, when was he striking again? Julie Green was nicknamed Sessy, and she was all the fun in the world. Laquetta probably knew Julie as they hung out with many of the same people, and the homeless shelter had records for both of them. Julie's biological father died when she was a toddler, then her mom remarried, and the family moved to Daytona Beach. But when she was eight, her mother died, so her stepfather adopted her. Julie's relationship with her stepfather was rocky, as he watched helplessly as she got into drug trouble. At 12, Julie fled home and lived away until she was 15. When she got home, struggling, she wanted more money, so she turned to sex work. That fateful night, she was on her way to the pay phone, when she perhaps met Robert, and the rest is a sad short story. They discovered Julie Green the same way they found Laquetta Gunther, with a bullet in the back of the head and the same 40 caliber handgun as Laquetta. At that point, detectives were unsure if they had a serial killer on the loose, but they were pretty sure he would kill again. Unless he were behind bars, he would never be able to stop praying for those poor women. All that was known about Julie's disappearance was, that no other signs or suspects had been found. It wasn't until over a month later that police found the body of 35-year-old Iwana Patton on a dirt road. She had been shot, but she might have struggled with her killer. A DNA test and a shell casing allowed police to identify the pistol. I will never understand why this happened. 
to my loved one. My sister was a fun lady to be around. She was the life of the party when she shows up. She worked hard and was educated and wanted more out of life. As we all know, that life was taken from her without a reason or a cause. My sister was a warm person and did not have to die in the manner that she did on that lonely night. My family needs closure. In fact, ballistics tests proved that the same gun was used to kill all three women. DNA samples were recovered from two victims, believed to come from the same individual. Still, no one in a DNA database matched them. Still, the police wouldn't commit, at least not publicly, to the serial killer story. A task force comprised of local and state authorities was formed to catch the killer. A detective from the Daytona Police Department was required to interview everyone living in the neighborhood. Among those local purchasers of that particular model was Robert Hayes. A police officer interviewed Hayes at his apartment near campus on Jefferson Street, near where three bodies were found, when Hayes was 24 years old. The report from that interview misspelt his name, it identified him as Robert Haynes, suggesting he was not a high-priority interview subject. In April 2006, months after Patton was killed, the interview lasted only a few minutes. When Hayes was asked whether he still owned the gun he had purchased, he said it was with his mother, who lived in West Palm Beach, and gave officers her number. Officers thanked him, and put the number in their records, on the shelf. Hayes used a 40 caliber Smith & Wesson firearm he bought at a Daytona Beach gun store. Perhaps, if more investigations had been pursued, even more lives would have been saved. And for the record, at the time of the killings, Hayes was a student at Bethune-Cookman University studying criminal justice. He lied about the gun because he knew what the police were investigating. He knew why they were there. He knew why they were looking for this gun. And he knew if he gave up that gun, that was it. He was caught. They'd have the murder weapon in their possession. That's why he lied to law enforcement. A few days after Hayes' interview, officers got a solid lead, and that's what happened next. A tip came in, a lead, on a person of interest that we identified as working at the junkyard. In an effort to try to uh, obtain that person's DNA sample covertly, uh, we established a surveillance to watch this person in hopes that he would discard something that might contain his DNA. Example would be a cigarette butt, a cup he may drink from, or a can. Uh, we established a surveillance at that location, somewhat surreptitiously under the guise of conducting another surveillance, all in hopes of watching this individual discard something so we could seize it and send it to the lab and compare it uh, against uh, the, the homicides evidence. A couple days into the surveillance, um, we were unsuccessful in doing that. The person of interest was determined to have a felony uh, conviction on their record. And during the interaction with the undercover agents on surveillance, he confided in them, that, in them and showed them a 45 caliber uh, firearm that he had and uh, bragged to them about having other firearms. So that produced evidence of yet another separate and independent crime which is carrying a concealed firearm by a felon. So we uh, obtained a warrant for that individual's arrest, and we sought out to arrest him at the junkyard that day. And while we were there, we received uh, consent to search the premises from the owner. So we searched the premises while we were there, so we had the opportunity to do so. And um, that's what resulted in the seizure of the tire that was identified back to the, uh, the Julie Green site. The police now have a piece of solid evidence, but they have no suspects. They have sexual assault evidence on all three murders and a 40 caliber bullet used in all three murders, but still, no suspect was found. Everyone on the Daytona Beach police force was waiting for the next hit, anytime soon. Profilers provided some helpful information but still didn't help much. 
It was believed that the suspect was a white male and might have been married, and he held some kind of hatred for the woman he loved. However, as suddenly as the murders started, they seemed to stop. Because it looked like the killer was a reckless criminal who left evidence behind, investigators believed he was improving his methods of dumping the bodies. Still, no more murders were committed by the serial killer in 2006 or 2007, either. As 2008 approached, police didn't even know if the suspect was still in the area as the investigation itself became cold. Nonetheless, the dust of the cold investigation was blown away in January 2008 when Stacy Gage's body was discovered. On January 2nd, a Daytona Beach policeman parked his patrol car in a secluded parking lot on Hancock Boulevard. As he thought about whether or not the killer was still alive, he rolled down the car window, and immediately smelled a foul odor. As he got out of his car, he found the body of Stacy Gage, which was decomposing. Even though Stacy wasn't known for sex work, she had suspiciously similar traits to the other three women. She lived a complicated life after dropping out of high school in her senior year. She did have a history of cocaine abuse, and it took all the best of her. On December 10, 2007, Stacy lived with her grandmother, and at night she drove to the store to buy ice. But, she never came home, after a few days, her grandmother reported her missing. Investigators found out Stacy was shot in the head with a single gunshot. Several weeks after Stacy died, Daytona Beach police announced that Stacy's murder was somehow connected to the others. They believed the suspect would repeat his last killings three months in a row. However, the killer never returned again. At least, that is what we believe. Because between December 2010 and April 2011, the bodies of 10 women were found buried under numerous beaches along Long Island, New York. All the women found had engaged in prostitution, similar to the killings in Daytona Beach. This prompted theories to suggest that both sets of murders could have been perpetrated by the same person. Some people also hinted at a possible connection to the eastbound strangler, the Atlantic City killer who murdered four women in 2006. And if it were to be correct, that meant an unidentified serial killer was responsible for up to 18 murders across the United States East Coast between 1996 and 2010. Investigators have publicly stated that there was no evidence to suggest one person was behind all the murders. And, other evidence collected over the years has since ruled out this theory. The known Daytona Beach massacres stopped for a decade, until Rachel Bay, a 32-year-old woman who worked in an area of West Palm Beach, was strangled on March 7, 2016, and dumped on the side of a highway. She was last seen walking toward the intersection, she usually worked around 2 a.m. the day she was killed. Bay was fully clothed at the time and carried her cell phone. However, her naked body was found by a road worker about six hours later, and her clothes and cell phone were missing. Bay's autopsy also showed that, besides being strangled, she had been severely beaten. She had fractures to her jaw, multiple broken teeth, and defensive injuries to her arms and hands that showed she fought for her life. While examining the seaman, laboratory workers generated a complete DNA profile. Bay's case detectives were notified in December 2016 that a DNA match was found in CODIS, the FBI's combined DNA index system. This match tied his genetic profile to that of the Daytona Beach suspect. But here's a trick to that. There's a waiting game. The chances of a suspect taking a DNA test to find out who their roots were are pretty slim. Therefore, law enforcement must hope and wait for a relative to do it for them. In December of 2016, um, we were both notified, the Daytona Beach Police Department and the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Department were notified that um, the unknown prof DNA profile from our case matched their case. Um, 
the Florida, you know, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement made the connection and then in turn notified both agencies. So beginning in December of 2016, early 2017, we began, the Daytona Beach Police Department began working with the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office doing a joint investigation, um, you know, sharing notes and information, trying to solve, um, you know, we you know we were looking for the same offender. But still, 2017, um, early into 2018, we really hadn't made any progress. We knew we were looking for the same person, but we had no idea who he was. But in April 2018, everything changed forever, when the Golden State Killer was arrested after his DNA was identified from a genealogy website. So in May of 2018, um, we made the decision, uh, there was a big case out of California, the, uh, the Golden State Killer, uh, Joseph D'Angelo, I believe he was arrested April of 2018. And I, um, around that time, you know, within a week or so, they announced how they did it using genetic genealogy. Um, so we made that decision uh, between the Daytona Beach Police Department and the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office to try it in our case, in our cases, because we knew we had this, you know, we have a complete DNA profile from our first victim. So we, you know, we thought genetic genealogy would be a, a way that we could gain, um, you know, identify, hopefully potentially identify our suspect. As it turned out, Previously unknown DNA from a family member of the Daytona Beach serial killer was submitted to a genealogy website. Still, once again, the exact relationship of that individual to the Daytona Beach serial killer remains unknown. However, that woman was the half-sister of the serial killer. Plus, she had three brothers, one of them, 37-year-old Robert Hayes. Somewhat ambiguous statement. 
one particular place that you relish more than you ever like that which you're going to spot or it's just more sporadic. Never did you told me to be. What about inside your car? Never. Never. Have you looked at this picture with Mr. Hayes? She advertised via back page. You know? And to be quite frank with you, sir, we have irrefutable scientific evidence that establishes that you know her. Not only did you know her, you had sex with her. Mr. Hayes. Alright. We'll work through that. Let me ask you another question, sir. You live at 5500 North Flagler? Okay. Did you ever have occasion back in the day when you, what was the last vehicle that you owned? Was that the Honda? Yes, sir. And so you've been basically traveling by bus yes, since uh, 16. Yes, sir. Okay. You know there's a lot of hookers on Broadway, right? Yeah. Everybody knows there's a lot of hookers on Broadway. Did you ever avail yourself of those, of those services, pick up a hooker on Broadway? Yes, Always on back page. Yes, Is there any reason why you wouldn't just pick up a girl on, on, on Broadway? Yes, Pardon me? You don't want nothing to do with Broadway, is what you're saying. To tell you the truth, I got real here. You know? The girls on that page are probably the high quality, right? You agree with me? Alright. Alright. Tell me what you know about DNA, sir. Detective Evans is much better at DNA than I am. And I, I, I would ask my friend to give you a little tutorial on DNA. Okay. Remember what I told you a couple of minutes ago? You have your profile. Robert Tyrone Hayes. You said you never met Rachel Ray. You said you never had an encounter with Rachel Ray. We have your DNA seeping inside of her vagina. Tell me about your family, sir. How many brothers do you have? There are two brothers and two sisters. Uh, the brothers, are they biological brothers? No, um, they the same mom. Same mom, different dad? Uh, so, no twins, right? Okay, Detective Evans, we'll keep talking to you. Just listen to him, what he has to say. You say you have some understanding of DNA, right, Mr. Hayes? Yes. So you know how significant and powerful DNA is, don't you, sir? Yes. Would you agree that from what you know about DNA, we, have all, we all have our own unique profile? Yes. You say you've never had any comment to replace the bank part of the All right. You don't? No, sir. That reason is right. Whatsoever? No, sir. I do not, sir. I, I don't want to hurt people getting on. I want to work and I come home. All right. Tell me something. When you dated on that page, did you have a preference for black women or white women, or you didn't care, or what? Whatever called my time. Whatever caught your eye. So you weren't particular. All right. You said something just now that captivated me. Remember you said I didn't do nothing to anybody? You just said that, right? You did. Why did you say that? No, no, I'm asking you, what, what led you to say I didn't do nothing to anybody? Because that's an unequivocal statement. I don't know why I'm here. You bring me my brothers and this woman. No, I didn't. No, what I did, Mr. Hayes, I asked you about Rachel Bay. I asked you, did I know her? You emphatically said no. I asked you if you've ever had any communication or interaction with her. You emphatically said no. I asked you if you ever had any sex with her. You emphatically said no. Then a couple minutes ago, you said... I didn't do anything to anybody. On September 15, 2019, Palm Beach County officials arrested Hayes, 37, at his West Palm Beach home for the killing of Rachel Bay. He was charged with one count of first-degree murder and was ordered to be held without bail. The DNA found on Bay matched DNA recovered from Gunther and Green, two of the Daytona Beach killer's victims, and ballistics tests connected Hayes to the killing of Patton. Ladies and gentlemen, the evidence in this case is clear. It's supported by 
science, it's supported by fact. And the evidence shows beyond a reasonable doubt that in December of 2005, excuse me, December of 2005, it was Mr. Hayes standing in that alleyway behind the Toyota Gunther pulling the trigger of a Smith & Wesson 40 caliber VE moments after he ejaculated into her mouth. It shows that it was Mr. Hayes who pressed the muzzle of the same 40 caliber Smith & Wesson VE into the back of Julie Green's head, leaving a burn mark from the firearm out in the middle of a field in a construction zone in the dark. And it shows beyond a reasonable doubt that it was Mr. Hayes who finally sent a bullet through the front of Ms. Patton's nasal cavity, passing through her head in a dark field, again in Daytona Beach. He lied about the gun because he knew what the police were investigating. He knew why they were there. He knew why they were looking for this gun. And he knew if he gave up that gun, that was it. He was caught. They'd have the murder weapon in their possession. That's why he lied to law enforcement. Hayes was transferred to Volusia County Jail, where he was charged with three additional counts of first-degree murder. Prosecutors originally sought the death penalty, when his trial began on February 11, 2022. On February 22, Hayes was found guilty of the murders of Laketa Gunther, Julie Green, and Iwana Patton. All here following the Constitution and the justice, and this was a horrific crime, crimes, obviously, and uh, I think the jury was very diligent in taking their time both on the guilty verdict, and they took a tremendous amount of time to determine whether he should live or die. And uh, I think from Justice's point of view, it's a very accurate decision. On March 2nd, Robert Hayes was sentenced to three consecutive life sentences without parole. My sister was a fun lady to be around. She was the life of the party when she shows up. She worked hard and was educated and wanted more out of life. As we all know, that life was taken from her without a reason or a cause. My sister was a warm person and did not have to die in the manner that she did on that lonely night. My family needs closure. I felt a duty to my mother to be here today in person to testify before this court that my mother meant something to many people and she was loved. I'm about to turn 41 in March. My mother was only 45 when she was taken from us in 2005. It's become very real to me just how young she still was. She had so much more life to live, love to give, and self-growth to achieve. My children and siblings have lost out on the chance to grow old with my mother. I have struggled these past 16 years for closure, closure in many ways. My mom mattered. I still feel connected to my mother, even in her death. How can I not? She's my mom. <laughs>